We're in our just Jesus, the words in red. And today we're going to read that, that intriguing little story about the ten virgins who were waiting on the groom to come and marry. It is a parallel to the church being ready for Christ's return. You know the story probably most of you. But we're going to read just that story and share some surprising things about that story. Matthew 25 verse 1 says, At that time the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins. At that time is referencing the end of the age because this began when the disciples said, Tell us what will be the end of time. Tell us what will be the signs of your coming and what will be the signs of the end of time. So at that time, that's what he's referring to, at the end of the Gentile age, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of the virgins were foolish and five were wise. When the foolish ones took their lamps, they did not take extra olive oil with them. The wise ones took a flask of olive oil with their lamps. When the bridegroom was delayed a long time, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. But at midnight, there was a shout, Look, the bridegroom is here. Come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, because our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there would be enough for you and for us. Go instead to those who sell oil and buy some for yourself. But while they had gone to buy it, the bridegroom arrived. And those who were ready went inside with him to the wedding band. Then the door was shut. Later, the other virgins came too, saying, Lord, Lord, let us in. But he replied, I tell you the truth, I do not know you. Therefore, he finished his story, and then he added this caveat, Therefore, stay alert, because you do not know the day or the hour. What a story, an intriguing story. Therefore, stay alert, because you do not know the day or the hour. And so he told this whole little story in order to tell us that in the end of the age, when the Lord is ready to come, when the groom is ready to come for his bride, there will be some parallels to this story. Or he wouldn't have told that story. And then he finishes by just saying, so just stay alert. So let me share five things with you from these verses. First one is the one that just kind of hangs there in the first sentence of his story. They're all called virgins, which means they're all pure. And they're all waiting for only one groom. They're not divided in their love or loyalty. We could amplify this on several counts. But let me just take the most politically incorrect one and tell you that it seems pretty clear to me from a reading of the Old and the New Testament that if you're a Christian, then you must believe Christ is all in all, Lord of lords, King of kings, and the only groom that's coming for a bride ever at the end of an age. There's not a, there's not like a big canopy where well, God loves everybody no matter what religion they belong to. And so when He does ever come, if He's coming, He's really coming for everybody, the Hindu, the Buddhist, the Muslim, and the Christian, and so on and so forth. And and, I, you know, it doesn't matter how politically nice that sounds. It's just totally bunk, if you believe the Scripture. If you, don't, if, you don't, if you don't want to be a Christian, that's fine. Don't be a Christian. But if you're going to be a Christian, be enough of a Christian to understand that, that Christ said Himself of Himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father unless He comes by me. So there is no way for a Christian to know God other than to know Him through Christ Jesus and as Christ Jesus. And if God chooses to have some other unique secret plan of trying to save somebody who's not Christian, 
so be it, he's God, that's up to him. But that way is not detailed in the scripture that you and I live by. And if you're going to live by that scripture and live by the Bible, then live by it right. Honor Christ. Love Him. Be loyal to Him and to His Word. And understand that you are waiting for Him to return. And no one else is going to ride that boat home but those who believe in Christ. And that's just plainly written in the Scripture. Believers in Christ are waiting for Him to come and He will rescue them and redeem them. Non-believers in Christ simply won't be ready. And if you're scared to death of the politics and you just can't believe God could be mean and cruel to let anybody go to hell, I, I, then just believe whatever you want to believe. But don't pretend it's in the Scripture because it's not. It's not God being mean. God was pretty good to just give us a book, a guide, a way of knowing. Trust in Him. Believe in Christ. How hard is that? His last commandment before the transfiguration, go into all the world teaching men the things that I have commanded you. And baptize them. That, that seems pretty clear that Christ wanted us to tell men about Him. I think sometimes the Christian church, well, we'll see in a couple of points what might be wrong with the Christian church today if indeed anything is wrong with her at all. Number two, the great distinction between the foolish and the wise seems to be only this. The wise prepared for the unexpected. They prepared for him to take longer than they thought at first he might take. Now, now I don't know if this is going to grab anybody's attention like it does mine or not, but you know, when you use the words wise and foolish, that 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 connotes uh, it connotes an image. Uh, I, I see somebody smart here, and I see Dupus over here. Dumb smart, dumb smart. But foolish is not dumb. Foolish is just in this instance. Foolish is just not planning for the long haul. You and I have to make an assumption. You know, you can take all the analogies and all the metaphors and all the assemblies and everything the Scripture gives us, everything Christ gave us in His parables, and you can milk them to death, and if you're not careful, you miss, uh, you miss the, the, the forest for singling out one tree. So, we don't ever try to take the metaphorical illustrations too far and, and say, you know, every little minute detail means that something and has to parallel to something going on. So, so I'm careful with that. By that same token, I have to make the assumption all ten of these people are ready for Him at one time. That means to me, they are theologically the same. They're all theologically accepted by Him. So I don't care what your denominational background is, what your theology is, what your philosophy is. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, no matter where any of us came from in our church life, we're all part of that virgin bride anticipating and waiting on the coming of the Lord and waiting on Him rightfully so because we are all part of the bride reserved in love with and loyal to the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet, according to this story, half of us will be foolish and half of us will be wise. So we just draw a line down the middle and we'll let y'all be the wise ones and y'all are the stupid. Oh, I'm sorry. See, it's not stupid, it's foolish. So let's just assume today is the bridegroom's day to come. Based on this particular story, you got a 50-50 chance of being ready. If we milk it to the nth degree, half of y'all are going to be saved, half of you are going to be lost. Because half of you are going to be foolish, half of you are going to be wise. But you can't interpolate it quite that way. You can't take every two Christians and say one of them is going to stay one of them is going to Every church and say half of us stay it, half of us go. I'd like to think every one of us in here are going when the bridegroom calls. And I like to think that your odds of going are really good. And if you came right now, I'd like to think that 98% of y'all are going, and I'm not going to tell you who I think the other 2%. <laughs> Call it no 90. <laughs> but 
if I had to look your direction. I'd, I'd like to think we're all going. But this story says a lot of people are not going. But then the distinction that it makes is something you and I have got to pay attention to. They're not going to miss it because in this illustration. In this illustration. They're not going to miss it because they were doctrinally off a little bit somewhere. That's not what this is about. They didn't miss the baptism doctrine or the Holy Spirit doctrine or some other Godhead doctrine. This illustration, this story he told us, simply tells us that five of them did not anticipate that he would take so long. And five of them thought ahead of time and thought, you know, it, 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 this might be a longer ordeal than I so, And that's it. That's the distinction between wife and food. And the only reason that it bears huge significance in this story is because he parallels it to the way the church will be at the end of the age when he finally comes back. And isn't it suggesting to us that a handful of people, Christian believers, at one time acted, actually was talking about their friend on Facebook going public and saying no longer believe in Christ, no longer believe in the Bible, I'm an atheist, I don't think there is a God. Isn't it quite possible that the longer we live, the more we may see more and more people simply not planning for the long haul and, and somewhere along the way saying, you know what, my daddy believed in Jesus and he, he used to tell me, God's going to come before you're married. My grandfather was a son. Everybody believed God was coming. Here we are. Look, it's 2015. They said Y2K. Y2K. Lord's going to come in 2000. That'll be 6,000 years of man. And you've heard it all. The first time I heard a preacher actually say the Lord's coming was imminent was 1967. And in a youth camp here in Texas with hundreds of kids there in a youth camp, a preacher got up and he said, because the Six-Day War had just begun in Israel, and a preacher got up and he said, if they cut that part, if they walk into Jerusalem, if those Jews walk into Jerusalem, I'm telling you, the Lord is fixing to come. The end of the Gentile age is here because they're going to take Jerusalem. And kids ran screaming into an altar and repented and gave their lives to Jesus in 1967. I know some of those kids. And I know some of them today that don't even darken the doors of a church. And they feel like they've been lied to, manipulated, and made to fear and twisted so many ways and so many times. Somewhere along the way, they just kind of ran out of oil and said, nah, I don't know. And that's the distinction shown in this parable by Christ. Some people are simply not going to anticipate that he's going to wait quite as long as he's going to wait. My daddy thought the Lord was going to come before he died. And uh, he died, I don't know how many years ago, but a long, 20, 30, I don't know, 1976. Yeah, 36, 36, 36. Like I said, 30 some many years ago. And I remember my dad praying and talking to me, the Lord's going to come, the Lord's going to come. And so here I am today in 2015, and, and you know, sometimes when I'm reading and studying, and I see the shape the world's in, I, I could just think, ah, man, this has been going on forever. Or I could just say, you know what, this book, this Bible is such a fascinating book. I choose to believe that it lights the way to Christ. It is the path to faith and belief. And I'm not endangered, endangered, I'm not harmed for believing in Jesus and hanging on to that belief to the very, very end. And I'm telling you, if He doesn't come before I die, and He might well not, if you, if you walk by my clothes coffin, because I'll probably tell them to close it in case my hair is not quite right. <laughs> so you walk by and pat the coffin and say, you know what? He knew the Lord probably wasn't going to come while they're still living, and he waited anyway until he died. And he's going to wake up in glory because he endured to his end, even if he didn't see the other 
and I'm telling you, I, I, I don't, I don't see, I don't read this story and think, oh, I gotta have so much more spirit than you gotta have. And some of my charismatic friends, and I was charismatic one time, some of my charismatic friends, they turn this into a Holy Spirit. The oil is symbolic of the Holy Ghost, and therefore you better have another portion of the Holy Ghost enough to last a little longer. And, and I don't see that. This is about anticipating how long it's going to take you to come back. It's not about having more spirit than somebody else has got. And if you can, it's about riding it out for the long haul. Now, I can tell you that standing here in 2015 as a 65-year-old minister, that when I began preaching this gospel in, in my 20s, there was so much difference in America as far as what we could preach and, and what we felt comfortable saying to people and, and what the government was allowing and permitting. I would not have dreamed in my 20s that there would ever come a time when churches might think that their tax exemption was ever going to be in jeopardy unless they approved of same-sex marriage. That was absolutely unthinkable, undiscussable, unimaginable in 1972. It wasn't even a topic on anybody's radar. You could have told people back then this is going to be a hot topic in a few decades and then it says, are you out of your mind? It is so biblically entrenched in morality and truth it can never be a hot topic in the Christian church. It is. It is. Carrie Underwood's pastor of a mega church has already announced a couple of weeks ago that a divine wind blew into his life and made him know that he has got to open up his leadership. The staff is now open to homosexual believers as much as anybody else, and they're welcome to be leaders in his church. And uh, there's a handful of us over here in the little tiny corner of the kingdom of Christ still saying, hey, wait just a minute now. Hey, homosexual. But homosexuality is not a civil class like blacks, whites, and Asians and Hispanics. Homosexuality is a sexual choice like adultery, like fornication of any kind, like incest. It is a choice you make the wrong direction. Even their own researchers have done their best to find a genetic gene. And they can't. i got a couple of quotes from them. If you'd like to read them, I'll send them to you on Facebook or anywhere else. Uh, and I got preacher buddies tiptoeing today. Oh my God, what are we going to do? Because they're going to lose famous member. I've got another friend who pastors a mega church out in Tennessee. And he's got some singing stars in his church. And he's so scared of this topic because he knows he's got a hundred people that might walk out tomorrow if he should take any kind of moral stand. And, and then God knows how long it would take before that trickle ended because that would just be the hundred people. That, that are active in the community in his town. Man. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? I don't know. You might not have enough oil to last the ride out. You might quit long before he comes back because it might be a little too intense and a little too tough for you. You might find out that your friends on Facebook start mocking you if you go to a church that preaches morality sanctity of marriage. They might criticize it for being might already have done that. You might have relatives that, that make fun of you and say, are you an idiot? Why would you keep going down there and listening to that moron carpenter? And you, you might be stupid to be here. I don't know. But I know this. God hasn't changed. The Word hasn't changed. Men have been trying to change it for 1,500 years now, reactively. It still says the same thing it always said. God still operates the same way He promised He would over the last 3,500 years. I, I'm just going to prepare for the long ride. I'm going to have enough ammo, oil to get me past the first crisis and then past the second crisis and past the third crisis. And I'm into the long run because the only difference I can see in being wise and foolish in the eyes of God and being ready or not ready is planning for Him to take a little longer than you had thought He might take. Number three. 
Both wise and foolish fell asleep before the groom. that he's going to claim and the ones he's going to reject all fell asleep. <laughs> you know, I love you. I love Jesus, but don't talk to me about it. Okay? Because personally, i got a bowling game coming up. I don't want my mind somewhere else. It'll distract me. I'll probably hit the gutter. Be your fault. And I'll be cussing you because you messed my head up before I got the bowl that strike. <laughs> We're talking about Jesus. Lord. Which one's the time you'll find? You know, Proverbs juxtaposes sleep with the sluggard. Awake from thy sleep, O thou sluggard. So on one hand, you can read these verses and say that Christ knew up front that he's predicting that all of us are going to be lazy and sleeping. Before he comes back. But you know me. I know you know. You know what? I let you know of me. Pretend that we're all transparent. You know. You don't know that I'm a positive person, but I really am. Deep down inside, I'm a positive kind of person. And when I, I sound negative. But behind my negativity, there's a lot of positivity. Unless I'm playing golf. When I'm playing golf, my negativity can overrule your positivity anytime I'm golf. I never think I'm going to get a good shot. It's always going to be bad. And then I'm not disappointed when it goes into creek. But I can also read this uh, story in, and, and read something entirely different into that sleep analogy than being lazy. Although I can understand that because I'm not sure, man, the, the Christian church. Do y'all know that the latest statistics we can prove are pretty accurate? Tell us that only 17% of Americans will actually be in church on a good Sunday. On a good Sunday. 17% of the people in America will be in church. 17%. I'm not sure that's even right. But that's the best number they've come up with in the last few months in the surveys. Is 17. You know, you probably still read, oh yeah, 40% of Americans go to church. No, they don't. You drive through Tomball on any given Sunday morning and you count the cars and all the church parking lots put together in here. I bet there's not 17% of our population. And, and I can look at the declining, we are declining church attendance rapidly. And I can look at the declining church attendance in America and I can say, here we are, we're going to sleep. And that might be right. But I also know that sometimes sleep is an indication of not being stressed out. That to fall asleep simply means you're comfortable. You've heard the story about the little boy trying to get a job on his neighboring farms and every farmer would say, well, son, you know, every day, at the end of the day, you got to put all the livestock right. And the boy's answer was, I sleep well on Monday nights. And you know, all the chickens got to be put, I sleep well on Monday nights. Well, but you know the horse, I sleep well on Monday nights. And finally, one of them hired a little snot just to give him a little job, part-time income. And the first few nights he was working for him, a storm blew up and the farmer jumped up and ran out and beat him a little boy door and said, oh, we got to go get stuff in. And the boy was sound asleep. And then the farmer ran out to the barn and found all the chickens in their coops and all the cages locked up right. And all the cows in the right pen and all the gates locked and all the horses secured in their stalls and the stables. And, and then he understood what the boy meant when he said, I sleep well on windy nights. 
He, he meant every night I lay down and pretend it might get windy and bad tonight, so I'm going to make sure everything is in place so I won't have to jump up in the middle of the night and go batten down the hatches. And, and I can tell you, I can, I can read this verse and see that very well because I, I, I learned to sleep well on Wednesday nights. I, 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 had, I had trouble sleeping at one time. And I had to play mind games with myself and find a way to communicate with God and get, get my head working right. When I first went to Vietnam, they, they didn't have a place for me yet in my company. I flew in and got on the helicopter and flew out to a uh, fire support base. And, and I, I reported to my commanding officer. He said, oh, you're early. And I said, well, I just came with the orders. I mean, it's, like, it's not like you, you travel on your own in the military. I had orders for you. Oh, you're early. Well, okay. I'm here. Oh, we don't have a place for you, and we got to, you're, you're going to fit a unique job that we hadn't even really created yet. So we're going to have to find a place to put you for a couple of weeks. Well, thank you very much. So they put me in a tent out in the middle of a field. The hooches were like, the closest hooch was probably as far as from here to the front doors of our church. And, uh, and they just set up an army green tent, and me and one other poor loser got there too early. You could have slept 30 men in that tent. I don't mean a little tent. I mean a green tent that was about as big as this whole wing right here. Chair. Big enough for 30 soldiers. And it's just me and one other sucker that got there too early and we had little wooden cots. Wooden legged folding <coughs> canvas cots. No pillow. And that's it. And that's where we slept with a, our, all of our gear in a, a duffel bag. No sandbags around us. I look out the flap of the tent, I'm smart enough to realize, I mean, it's all strange, you know, first day or two, you're like, what? This is where we're going to live? You know, you, 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 your bathrooms were like a 55-gallon drum with a piece of plywood over it, and the mama sons and papa sons would come by every couple of days and throw diesel gas in that drum and burn it, and, uh, and that's how you flush it. You know, every couple of days, they, they throw diesel gas in there and burn it, you don't get toilet seats or anything. You get a plywood board with a hole cut out in it. And that, that's it. You, you dig a hole in the ground, you put a 55 gallon drum in there with a few holes knocked in it with a hammer. And you bury it to about this high, and that's your urine. And it's just outside somewhere. A little piece of tin around it. I'm not lying. I, that, and that hot water and all that good stuff. That's some of you getting out of that, you know. And, I, and the first night I'm laying there, and I hear border rounds hitting our camp and blowing stuff up. And I look out the flap and I realize all oh, these boys aren't running because they're in hooches with sandbags around them. And me and other loser, we got no sandbags. We're in a flapping tent on a cot. I don't mind telling you, this 18-year-old this, this boy didn't sleep very well at all. In fact, I didn't sleep. And the third day of no sleep, I went to the commanding officer. I said, that much longer, sir, before I have a place to live, a fleet, a room. Can I get in one of these hooches? I don't have that room for you yet. It'll be a couple of weeks. I don't know if I can live two weeks and stay awake all night biting my fingernails down to the bone. And, and that's what that'd be. I'm just cuddled up on that cot every night listening to those pounding sounds of incoming mortars dropping and our artillery booming more things back out to them, and it's just a, you don't sleep. I had to learn how to get my mind in a safe place and think of, of, of things that didn't pertain to anything I was doing. I couldn't lay there and think about where I'm sleeping and what my tent is made of and, and how unprotected I am and what how nice a sandbag would be. Couldn't think about it. I had to think about other things entirely. I had to get my mind off of my world and try to find a way to get it into God's world and just learn to find God in my thoughts. And did you know it's possible? I learned how to lay down with the booming noises. I learned how to ignore the noises and take my mind somewhere else with God and sleep. My wife will tell you 
You could come in my house today. You could steal the bed out from under me. Lay me back down on the floor. I would wake up in the morning and say, I guess my wife here ran while I was asleep because I would not wake up. I sleep well on Monday nights because I learned that when you're afraid of the environment around you, you have to, you have to take your brain to the safe places it knows. And the safest places I learned as a boy were in the Lord Jesus Christ and the promises of His Word. And I would lay awake in the bed and memorize those verses during the day so I could quote them at night to myself and then lay there and find a way to connect with God. David said it one time, the King David of Israel, he said, when I lay on my bed in the night watches, I will meditate on Thee. I will dwell on Thee. It was David's way of finding rest in the midst of the storm. It is just possible that all he's really trying to tell us in this verse is that even though the storm is going to be pretty hectic in the end of the age, because he's already told us that in the previous chapter. There are going to be earthquakes, divers places, famines, pestilence, wars and rumors of war. They're going to deliver you over to council. You'll be hated of all men for my name's sake. And then he flips the page and we go to chapter 25 and he says, and all of the bride waiting will be sleeping. Remember last week how he described what's going to happen in chapter 24? And now he tells us we're going to be asleep. See, you can say, well, see there, that's just lethargy. Or you can say, in the middle of the worst calamity this world has ever known. In the middle of the worst wars that we've ever imagined that are coming. So badly, one verse in the Bible even says, and in those days men's hearts will fail them for fear of the things that are coming to them. But not the church. The church will be sleeping. You understand what I'm telling you from this verse? You can read it negatively and fearfully if you want to. Or you can say, He's already told us all chaos is coming. And yet, in the middle of that, and the, the bride is sleeping. And at midnight, the darkest hour you can guess is all He's trying to refer to. He comes. Number four. Oh wait, number four. Number four. When the groom came, he came for an immediate response. It would be great if we could believe that just before the ending of the age, Christ is going to do something so unique and so dramatic. All of us will know that the clock is now 10 seconds away. Y'all know the, are y'all familiar with the doomsday clock, people? You know, they moved it to three minutes now. Now, in light of what's happening in the Middle East, first time in like four decades or something, now they, that they have moved the doomsday clock to three minutes before midnight. If you're not familiar with what that is, that kind of, that kind of generated back in our Cold War with Russia days when I was a youngster. There's still an existent organization who just predicts the time they think that the world will come to World War III that will be like no other war ever. And so Google it. Sometime when you have time to read it, you'll see where they come from and why they have now moved the clock to three minutes before midnight for the world of World War III and utter nuclear chaos coming to this world. Netanyahu trying to speak to Congress. Some senators do not want to hear him. I say senators in quotes because it's hard to get called. All 540 some of those people, senators and Congress. God bless them, but we've lost all of our statesman sensibility in America, it seems. The president's opposing him speaking, just trying to save his country. The president said, oh, he's just trying to get an election won using our Congress. But then our president goes and parades the Indian politicians who are running for an election coming up next month. So I don't know how that all washes out. I don't think there's going to be a three minute before midnight warning. I don't think there's going to be like, oh, if they start building that temple, the whole church will start running back to church buildings. Believers everywhere will start waking up. Don't think so. According to this story, there's not going to be any indication, no hint 
no, 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 just all of a sudden, somebody gonna come beat on the door. He's here! Let's go! And so I'm just telling you that from this story, it looks to me like when he comes, he's just coming. And finally, the foolish knew they had been ready at some point in time. They also knew they were not ready at the time he came. This may not be a, a good this may not be a good point for some of you. And it might have, it might offend your theology depending on your upbringing, denominational upbringing. If you're wondering why I'm setting this up that way, look at that statement one more time. The foolish knew that they had been ready at some point in time. They also knew they were not ready when he came. So much for once saved, always saved theology. I'm sorry. I know that's offensive. <coughs> I know. I can feel the barge coming back at me right now. <laughs> I was taught once saved, always saved all my life, and you're not going to take that away from me. Okay. I, 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 I'm not going to try to take it away from you. I don't want to offend anybody. I once saved, always saved theology. I'm just going to tell you that according to a parable Jesus gave us, a handful of people are going to be able to say, if he had just come last year, I was ready. But because I, I, I didn't have enough to last for his long delay, now he catches me cold. No warmth, no flame, no fire, no spirit, no life. I kind of quit. But I once was, but now I kind of stand out. You don't like that point. You don't even <laughs> want to hear it. You, you just want to believe no matter how good you are today, if you kind of fall off the turnip wagon in the next five years, God's still going to ignore that you fell off the turnip wagon and come rescue you, save you. And maybe He will. God bless you. I hope He does. But as for me and my house, we will just continue to serve the Lord in spite of politics, in spite of government, in spite of what the church world does, in spite of what bishops and elders and popes and priests continue to tell us we better or better not do. We will just continue to turn to the Word of God, let the Word be our God. We will continue to let Jesus Christ be all in all, everything, King of kings, Lord of lords. And we'll also continue to honor Christ by doing exactly as He did, and that is... Even though you know what's right and wrong, you still take a stand. You still love. You take a stand. You love. You take a stand. Don't hate anybody. No animosity toward anybody. Toward them. But you got to take a stand. Paul wrote one simple troubling verse. He said, having done all, then just stand. And that's kind of where the church is coming to today. You, you do all you can do to preach morality. And don't have sex before you marry. Don't practice homosexuality. Don't, don't, you know, somebody asked me the other day, are you going to write anything about this uh, movie that Fifty Shades of Something Purple? And I said, why would I write about something I don't know anything about? didn't read the book, don't plan to watch the movie, because I could already tell from the early notions of it, that's not something my heart and spirit and flesh will benefit from. I, I, I don't... God, that's become mainstream for Christianity anymore. Why? Not, not, not if you're trying to plan for the long haul, keep enough oil reserved. Hang it on just in case he hangs on. Search your heart, search your soul, know that you're a believer in Jesus Christ, and know that your mind's made up to endure to the end. And Jesus himself said, Blessed is he that endures to the end, for the same shall be saved. Father, thank you today for the promise of your word. Thank you that you promised us that when it got to the end, if we just hang on to our faith in you, we trust in you, all the way to the end, the same shall be saved. And that's where we stand today in Jesus' wonderful name. Somebody say, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of